Hello and welcome back. We are about ready to begin our next Bible study. We're going to be finishing up chapter 28 of 1 Samuel. If you'll remember, last week we went on into the first couple of verses in chapter 28. And uh, since the natural break was there between verse 2 and 3, that's where we decided to, to take the, the break, if you will. And, and now we're going to be switching focus uh, from David back to Saul. And as we're doing this back and forth, we're seeing God uh, bringing judgment now on Saul. But uh, I want to emphasize one thing during this particular Bible study. And the fact is, is that in this chapter, as well as in our lives and throughout the Bible, what we find is that our sin, our own sin, brings self-destruction on us. There's some people who say God and his divine love would never punish us. Uh, that's simply not true because our own sin brings destruction on us. Remember, if you will, about Saul, before we go into this particular chapter, give some background, remember a little bit of what has happened in his life. Saul has deliberately gone around, gone about dis disobeying God. And uh, when he disobeyed God in chapter 15, given specific instructions that he was to go, he was to completely destroy the Amalekites. And that's when he comes back with all of the choice uh, cattle and sheep and, and he blames it on the people, if you will. But at that point, he has set himself up against God by disobeying. This is a situation, and we're going to get to that in just a little bit, where God is saying, look, you have done something that is beyond uh, beyond uh, uh, your abilities, uh, beyond you being able to do something. Now, that doesn't mean that Saul, had he repented, not been able to come back into the presence of the Lord. Here's the thing. Saul has deliberately made himself an enemy of God. Matter of fact, in his lifetime, from the moment where he disobeys in uh, the situation in chapter 15 with the Amalekites, all the way through to the end of his life, there is no record of him consulting the Lord. Just to the opposite. What it says is that he specifically destroys any and every opportunity that he would have to have direct contact with God. Let me remind you of some of the things that have happened. In that same chapter 15 and verse 35, it says, Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him, the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. And so all of the time that he was king, from that moment on, he never, Saul, never sought out Samuel for divine intervention or for divine guidance. And he never has revelation, except for if you take that, that portion in Scripture of chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, when all of a sudden the Spirit of God comes upon Saul and he prophesies, and this is when David can get, get away. It really wasn't an encounter with revelation or with wisdom from God, direction from God, but rather it was aimed in a direction in which God could protect David. Now, if you remember, when he goes into Nob and he's going to murder or kill off all of the priests, what in effect is he doing? We already talked about the fact that he has set himself up as God's enemy. Matter of fact, anybody who sins is God's enemy because sin is the antithesis or the enemy of God. But here we find in that chapter where he destroys all of the priests, it says in chapter 22 of 1 Samuel, remember the, the, the information getting to Saul. Here's what it says. It says, Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions and the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Now, this is the information getting back to Saul. But what are we hearing from that? That going to the priest gives you some divine revelation. He, they will seek God on your behalf and give you an answer. But it doesn't say that Saul was the one, but rather David is the one to go. A few verses later in that same chapter 22, it says, Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me? You and the son of Jesse giving him bread and a sword and inquiring of God for him so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me as he does be, as he does today. In other words, Saul is accepting the fact that he is God's enemy and God giving God a godly revelation to somebody else simply means that they're being protected by God when already Saul has decided to be his enemy. In verse 15 of that same chapter, it says, 
was that day the first time I inquired of God for him. Ahimelech, in other words, says, you know what? I've always done this for, for David. David wants to hear from God. And he says, of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant of any or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. You see, Saul wasn't the one seeking God. It was David who was seeking God. Now, we understand that this is the case. Saul comes and he says in this particular text where we're going to have Saul and this seance in this medium, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But when we, we see this, he says that God's not answering. Well, God isn't going to answer when you destroy all of the, the ways that he could answer you. You know, there's some people who say, I want God to answer me, but they don't bother to go and read the Bible. They don't bother to go to church. They don't bother to, to listen to a, a preaching or Bible teaching. They just walk around in nature and they say, well, God, you're a God of nature. And you should be able to speak to me and these kinds of things. But when we've destroyed or we've taken away God's natural sources of spirit, speaking to us, how can we expect God to speak to us? And so Saul, in our text, is going to go to a medium. And I feel like we need to set up a little bit of understanding what this means. First of all, we are specifically, even in our text, told we cannot go to mediums. Now, some people, especially in our educated Western uh, hemisphere culture, uh, we think that spirits and, and, and stuff is, is a bygone era, but the reality is, is that there are spirits. And we have here in our text a clear understanding of this medium, the spiritist, calling up the image and the person or spirit of Samuel. And you say, how can that be? Well, I am not going to sit here and explain the ways of the devil to you because that's not the way that we're going to work this thing because we shouldn't even know and I'm not going to even take time to try to figure it out and study it. But we do know that they exist. If you go into scripture, for example, Jesus one moment gives this parable of a story between a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus. Both of them have died and there is still interaction taking place. Amongst the dead, I don't know all of the details. I have not been there. I'm not planning on being there. Uh, that, that's something of, of before Jesus, this, this situation of Sheol, where they were, there was a waiting time because Jesus hadn't offered the perfect sacrifice. Now, as believers, when we die, we go directly to the presence of God, and that we understand. But here we are in the Old Testament, and uh, so Samuel is not in the presence of God, if you will, but rather in this holding place in, in Sheol is what they're, they're going to call it. And the medium calls up the spirit of Samuel. Now, this is something that has happened throughout scripture and God condemns it. In Isaiah, there's a lot of talk in the, the book of the prophet Isaiah about mediums and spiritists. Let me read for you a couple of things that he says here. In Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19, it says, when someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? You see, God is not telling us that the dead don't have some sort of information. He's not telling us that astrology, uh, the, the stars don't contain some sort of information. He's simply saying, don't go looking for that information Look to me. I want to be your source. I want to be the one. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people, even good intending Christians, who have been sucked into this mysticism, thinking that this is another form of, of power, of authority. Uh, they channel, they do. And, and I've heard people even say that this one is a Christian version of that. Well, that just doesn't exist because God has said, look to me. I am your healer. I am the one that's going to be your supplier. And so this is the question that Isaiah, he doesn't say that the mediums and the spiritists can't whisper and mutter to them and give them information from beyond the grave. He's saying, don't do that because God is the one that you're supposed to inquire of. God is the one who has the information and he will give it to you according to your need. And he knows what you need to know. And you have to wonder, did Saul really need to know the information that God was going to remove him from the earth the following day? Obviously, it destroys him. It becomes a situation. We haven't read the text yet, but uh, you understand where we're going. There's times when we just simply should not know and 
God is the wise one who knows when we should know. Now, when they say medium, the Hebrew word for medium it's kind of an interesting situation because there's uh, some sort of a, a crossover, if you will. There's clearly a medium that is a person that uh, somehow is this link between the dead and the alive. Uh, all of the details of that, again, I don't understand and I don't want to understand. But that Hebrew word also means a pit. Now, it's kind of interesting because they literally dug a pit. And into this pit, you know, in our culture today, you have these, uh, the situation where you have this uh, gypsy lady looking into a crystal ball or, or uh, in, in some cartoons uh, uh, that uh, really are not good for children nor for adults, uh, have this witch or warlock that is looking into a crystal ball, and that's the impression we get. But in the Old Testament, the word in Hebrew for medium means a pit, and they would literally dig this pit down several feet as though they're trying to dig toward the grave and the spiritist or the medium and this is where there's a crossover because it's both the pit and the the person doing it uh, begins to speak into the pit and the pit uh, from the pit begins to have these words or these mutterings and they're sometimes very difficult to understand according to some of the scriptures that we have there in Isaiah as well in chapter 14 and verse 9 it says that the realm of the dead below is all astir to meet you at your coming. Now, this is a prophecy against the king of Babylon, and he's going to soon die. He says, it rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you, all those who were leaders in the world. It makes them rise from their thrones, all those who were kings over the nations. And so there is a spirit realm that's taking place. But when we talk about this pit, Isaiah again says in chapter 29 and verse 4, says, brought low, you will speak from the ground. Your speech will mumble out of the dust. Your voice will come ghost-like from the earth. Out of the dust, your speech will whisper. And so there's, there's this tendency, even in the days of Isaiah, in the days of the, the Old Testament prophets prior to Christ, to look for revelation in a source that is not God. And this is what Saul is going to fall prey to. But let me be very clear here. One of the things that we're going to see here in this chapter, those verses 3 through 25, is going to be that Saul forfeits divine guidance because he opposes God. Now, his opposition to God, he says, I don't want to hear from God. And then he goes about trying to do the other things. But when God finally does speak, he reiterates the rejection of Saul and announces the king's impending death here in this chapter. Now, what is what are we learning here? That the wages of sin is death. Saul has brought this on himself. And Saul is about ready to die. Matter of fact, if we read the scripture, the very opening verse of the text that we're going to look at in verse 3 says, Now Samuel was dead. This whole thing has this death overshadowing it. It has Samuel being dead. It has a, a story about going to a medium that's going to consult the dead. It's all about Saul going to be dead. And he's already spiritually dead. So let's go ahead and read our text. We have it here in chapter 28, verse 3. I'll read on through verse 25. It says, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came up and set up camp at Shenum, while Saul gathered all, the, all Israel and set up camp in Geboah. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on the clothes, and on other clothes, and at night he and two men went with the woman. Consult the spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? 
Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. So the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like? He asked, the old man, an old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself to the, with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what I predicted what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and all that night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your servant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so you may eat and have strength to go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his women and his men joined the woman in urging him and he listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fatted calf at the house, which she butchered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it, and baked some bread with, without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men and they ate the same night they got up. And left. So there we have our text that we're going to be looking at, uh, studying verse by verse, and, and we're going to pick it up at the very beginning. As I mentioned, it starts off with Samuel being dead, and it says that they had all mourned for him. It says in the verse three, now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him. Now it's interesting because the next time we see the mourning taking place, it's for Saul and his family. In chapter thirty-one, the first Samuel verse thirteen says, then. They they took their bones and buried them under the Tamar's tree of Jebesh, and they fasted seven days. They buried. And in verse one, chapter 1, verse 12 of 2 Samuel, it says, They mourned and wept, fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan, for, and for the army of the Lord, and for the nation of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. There was mourning and weeping. In verse uh, 4 and 5 of chapter 2, 2 Samuel, it says, Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and, and there they anointed David. David king over the tribe of Judah. When David was told that the men of Jabesh Gilead who had buried who had buried Saul, he sent messengers to them to say to them, "The Lord bless you for showing this kindness to your Saul, to Saul, your master, by burying him." So the next time this mentions mourning and burying, as it does here for Saul in chapter twenty-eight and verse three, is going to say it again about Saul. And it clearly says that Saul, in that same verse 3, had expelled the mediums and the spiritists. And you may say, well, that's a good sign. That means that he was obeying what God had said. Matter of fact, that's part of the, the uh, law of Moses, that these people should have no place in Israel because they're going to be a temptation. There's going to be a problem that's going to be pulling on the people of Israel that they would end up with information that they should not know when they should be trusting God. And so Saul has done this. But just to the opposite, it doesn't mean something positive about Saul. It means that Saul knows that God forbids this, and nonetheless, he's wanting to consult the medium. So his knowing and then looking for one still around, he says, I am willing as one of my last acts 
to violate the law of God because I want the information. And in verse 4, it says, The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shinnem, and while Saul gathered all, all Israel to set up camp at Geboah. Now, here's where the story gets very interesting. It means that, again, we are overshadowing with what has happened previously. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? What has happened previously that resembles what's going to happen here? Well, this is what has happened all the way back at the beginning of our study in chapter 4, if you will. This is when the people of Israel gather up. And the last time both were establishing camps was in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 1. And this is when, because of disobedience, Eli's sons were going to be murdered. We're going to be killed, not murdered. They're going to be killed on the battlefield. This is when the ark of God goes into Philistine territory. Let me read it for you. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 1, And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Ephek. And when they both set up camp, the next time both of them are re recorded in 1 Samuel as setting up camp, it's here. It's kind of giving us this foreboding. The same thing is happening. When one family, Eli and his children, they were disobedient to God. They were sinful. And God is going to remove them. This is what has happened before. And you remember that when Eli's sons go out and they are in, in uh, responsible for the carrying of the ark, and it says that Eli's heart was fearful. Eli's heart was afraid. Uh, it says that, it, that it, in chapter, the same chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, when he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching because his heart feared for the ark of God. When the man entered the town and, and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. And this is because Eli's sons are dead and Eli's going to fall over backwards. His neck's going to be broken and he's going to die. We've already studied that because fear had filled his heart. Well, the same thing happens in verse 5 of our text. It says, when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. This is what's happening. There, we're, we're seeing the same storyline play out because disobedience sets us up as enemies of God. Well, it's going to be even more than that, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. It says in verse 6, He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or urim or prophets. Now, this is an interesting phrase. Now, how is it that God would not answer him by any of these means? Well, we can simply say God just simply doesn't say anything with, with a dream. Well, you can't control your dreams, and God says, I'm not speaking to him through the dreams. Through prophets, well, he's already, we've already registered that Samuel is dead. Uh, no prophet just materializes saying, thus says the Lord. But this phrase about the Urim, uh, here it says by uh, dreams or Urim or prophets. Now, this is a part of the Old Testament culture and history that we don't understand fully. Uh, great strides have been made in trying to decipher what this means, but it's a word that doesn't show up anywhere else in, e in any other application, only when it's talking about this. Let me explain what people, especially the Bible scholars, have decided probably it is. Now, again, we're in a probable situation. And uh, you got to understand that there is a lot of background for what I'm going to say. Uh, what they think this is, is a type of special lots that were cast. Um, now, if you remember, they used very special uh, gems or stones in creating the, the priestly garments. They used these to even put in uh, names of particular tribes, all of the tribes on the breastplate and so forth, and, and dedicated them to the Lord and so on. It appears that there was... Uh, I don't know how they looked or what the deal was. It was almost like dice that the priest would roll and give an answer and it would be simply an answer of yes or no. And um, 
you say, wow, that's a lot like uh, spiritism. And, and, so, and, and that's why we don't talk a whole lot about it. And we don't understand everything. But clearly in the Old Testament, there was a portion that was of the devil. And there was a portion of, the, of what God would do. Um, and if you remember, for example, in the story of Jonah, all of the, the sailors cast lots and the lot falls on Jonah. And they say, what have you done? And they knew that God was guiding the casting of these lots. Uh, the same thing takes place even in the New Testament of deciding on on uh, who would be the disciple or the apostle who would take Judas place after he was no longer an apostle and it killed himself. Uh, and so I, I, I don't want to go into great detail with this because this isn't something that we understand. And so uh, when you don't understand something, you certainly can't teach it. But um, it seems strange that you would have a lot or some sort of a, of a dice and when you'd roll it, gravity would mean that it has to come up some way. And it says that God, the Lord, did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. And so this is kind of a, a unique situation because how would you know that God didn't answer? Because it would have to come up something. Well, there are two options that we have to answer that. One option is that the practice of the Urim would have to be done several times and to a place where chance couldn't be just guiding it, that God was the one moving and creating this answer. And uh, so it would have to come up with the same exact answer multiple times in a row. That's what one uh, Bible scholar suggests. Um, another one uh, suggests something completely unique, and I hadn't even contemplated it yet uh, when I was studying for this particular study here, uh, and it, it gives the indication that they would not have been completely balanced. Like in our case, uh, in board games, there's a dice sometimes, and they have six sides, and, it, and it's always going to come up on one of the six, and they're going to have the numbers one through six on it, and you can move around the board or what have you in Monopoly or whatever game you may be playing. But in this particular case, it wouldn't have been completely and perfectly balanced. There was a one side and another side, and uh, it wasn't uh, six different options, but rather it was a yes or a no. And uh, so it would it would be as long as the, the one guy that I, I read said, wouldn't it be unique if God so much says, I don't want to give you an answer. And when you roll, and it's not like a dice that we could imagine, but more like a domino. And so it's flat, long, and has a, a, something engraved on one side, something engraved on the other. It would give some sort of an answer. And every time they would throw this domino, if you will, uh, this urim, it would show up and fall on its edge. Uh, that would be very unique, obviously, to have seen and, and God simply say, no, I am not going to answer you at all. However, what it, what it means is that he says that he begins to try to look to God, but he's already eliminated all of the legitimate ways of hearing from God and God is not going to answer him. So in verse 8, Saul gets to this place and he says that he wants this woman to consult a spirit for him. Saul uses that, that verb, you consult, and it eerily echoes Samuel's words earlier in the in his condemnation. Remember I said that all of this started in 1 Samuel 15. Now here is Saul with a medium, a spiritist. He's involved in what you could call witchcraft. And he, he had already heard from Samuel when Samuel turns to leave. He says in 1 Samuel 15 in verse 23, for rebellion is like the sin of divination. Isn't that interesting? He has allowed himself to be sold down the road so long that rebellion, this opening of your heart to sin, to rebellion, allows you to go so far down the road that this is what happens. This is And arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. That's what 1 Samuel 15, 23 says. So 
he goes now and he's involved in divination, not because it doesn't work again, but because we are told not to. It's sin. Remember this. And I don't want to give emphasis on the fact that it works because that's not the point. And astrology, that's not the point. We are the body of Christ and we live for him and we walk by faith and he will give us what we need. He is our source. He is our, our, our strength. And so Saul in verse 10 swears to her by the Lord, it says. Verse 10, Saul swore to her by the Lord. Now, this is crazy. Here you go to a spiritist who is an evil person who's condemned to death by the Old Testament law. And you say, as surely as the Lord lives. Well, should does that sound strange to you? Because here, even those involved in these evil practices, and you know what? It's crazy. We have the same thing happening today. You have some of the worst sinners. And what's the word that comes out of it? And this is, to me, offensive. That we have some violent criminals, murderers, drug dealers. We have the people that are worse on the streets. And they use the name of Jesus more than we do. They say they don't believe in Jesus. But they're taking his name in vain. And using his name as a cuss word. And here we have these two. We have the woman accepting this as a valid promise and Saul saying, as surely as the Lord lives. But you know what? Saul's in the middle of sinning. If he's in the middle of sinning, you would think that he wouldn't want God to even know where he's at. He was trying to run away as Jonah had done. But he said, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. This was a binding oath that he's offering. And so the woman goes ahead and she begins this seance, if you will. And in the process, brings up this, this image. And, and when the image comes up, it actually scares the woman. It says in verse 12, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. Now it's interesting because the woman hasn't figured out it's Saul yet not by any of the things that we've already seen happen. After all, he shows up disguised. He's wearing other clothing and he's given this promise that she's not going to be punished. But all of a sudden, when Samuel comes and shows up, and she had already been told who she was looking for, Samuel. So why was she afraid? Well, we see that he has robes on. And uh, who knows what the situation was. Perhaps in all of her experience before, there was nobody that would show up with such pomp and fanfare as Samuel had. So this has to be somebody really important. And she figured out by the way that Samuel arrives that this is in fact Saul the king. And it frightens her because that would mean her sudden death and so forth. We, I don't know why she's frightened if she's already been a medium and a spiritist before. But the clarity could be of it. And, and, and she showing up rather than just the sound of the voice from below uh, as it would be that whispering and they wouldn't normally see something, but rather it would be the sound and the voice alone showing up. Don't know what was the situation, but it frightens her. So that Saul asks, what does he look like? And she gives him this answer. An old man wearing a robe is coming up. And that's enough information for Saul to know that this is Samuel. It says when Saul knew, Saul knew it was Samuel. And it's interesting because Saul has already seen that guy with the robe before. If we go back again to 1 Samuel 15, it says, as Saul, in verse 27, as Saul turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and it tore. So the last time he saw Samuel, he tore the robe. And this is when God tells him in verse 17 of uh, uh, here, he says, the Lord has done what he predicted through me. And this is in chapter 28. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands. Because that's exactly what he had told him would happen there in chapter 15. He says, uh, he said, uh, Samuel said to him, 
the Lord has torn, I'm in chapter 15, verse 28, the Lord has torn from the, the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. And so when Samuel arrives, he says, why do you consult me? He shows up bothered. He says, this has nothing, you shouldn't have bothered. You shouldn't have done this. This is a terrible thing that you were doing. And, and he, it's, it's clear that it really is Samuel. And this is why it's quite confusing, the text. But in the process, Samuel says, look, the Lord has done what he predicted he was going to do through me. He's torn the kingdom out of your hands. So when Saul sees the robe, all of a sudden he bows down and he says, this is something very serious. In verse 17, he says, and he brings very clear, because the earlier verse in chapter 15 it says that he's torn it out of your hand and given to one better than you. That's what it says in 1528. So here in 28, chapter 28 and verse 17, it says the Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Now he names him specifically. It's too late for Saul to do anything about it. Interesting. David's gone off into Philistine territory, afraid of Saul. And God's come, saying, you know what? This, this guy has no more chance. And, the, and it's at the end. This has been something that is to fulfill the prophecy, fulfill what God has already established. So the Lord, he says in verse 19, the Lord will deliver both Israel and and you into the hands of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Now, this is a, a, a sad turning point, if you will, in our text, because we've grown to love this son of Saul named Jonathan. Matter of fact, David loves him and, and would make him second in command. And, and Jonathan is a person of integrity. But the sin of his father has already been established and God's sentence is already here because God has already said that he would remove all of his descendants. If you will, back in 1 Samuel 18 and verse 17, it says, Saul said to David, here's my older daughter, Merib. Uh, and, and Saul is trying to kill David through the use of the Philistines, but uh, through all of these verses, while David now is in Philistine territory, and it's going to be the Philistines who kill off Saul. But not only Saul, but his children. His children. He's going to be handed over to the Philistines, and it's sad. But this is because God has already de declared that your dynasty will come to an end. And so if you remember, Saul using the Philistines to try to kill off David over and over again. In chapter 18, verse 17, he says, uh, I'll give my daughter to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of the Lord. For Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines do that. So the Philistines will kill off David for me, Saul thought. And in the same chapter, in verse 21, it says, I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may be a snare to him, and so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So Saul said to David, How, Now you have a second opportunity to become my son-in-law. In the same chapter, verse 25, Saul replied, Say to David, the king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of of the of Philistines. And so what we see is that immediately Saul is the one who sets up a trap, but it's Saul who falls into it. And then, you know, this is something that we can trust in God for. We don't have to defend ourselves. God can make the escape for us, and God will often cause the sins of other people to be piled up on themselves. When they come and they try to attack us, it's soon revealed of who they really are, and it comes back on their own heads. And so it says, though, he says, you and your sons, and this brings about the, the, the judgment uh, announced against his dynasty all the way back in chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. And uh, it reveals, again, a parallel that takes place 
in the story at the beginning of our first Samuel of Eli, as God says, your dynasty, or in this particular case, your priesthood will not last. I will completely eliminate it, which takes place, as we already have studied, in the life and the, the reign of Solomon, who finally removes all traces of this priesthood of Eli. And so again, we're finding parallel that those who do not serve the Lord, who walk in disobedience, will not have an inheritance amongst his people. And in chapter 28, going back, and in verse 22, it says, Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so that you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. Now, and say, what's important about that verse? Well, this is the sealing of the fate. If you will remember back at the moment when Saul first meets Samuel, in chapter 9, verse 19 to chapter 10, this was a case where he's looking for his donkeys, he's looking for these animals, and he goes towards Samuel. If you remember way back in that study, and when he goes to Samuel, uh, he sees some women. They say, you know, we can't eat until uh, these girls, until uh, the, the priest or the prophet gets there. It's all about him. And, and when they show up, Samuel invites Saul to eat. He says, remember, I've got this special portion already set aside for you. And this is the moment where God comes upon Saul as king. This is the moment when Samuel anoints Saul and Saul is filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Go back and look at that in chapter 9. Now, why is that interesting? Because now he's gone full circle. The Spirit of the Lord has left him. And now he's gone looking to the devil for advice. He's gone to the medium. And what does she do? The same thing. Let me have, give you something to eat. And they kill the fatted calf. And now Saul is eating. And this is something that immediately, he's already heard of his impending death. All of his family is going to die. And what's he doing? He's going to eat and have a meal with the devil. Wow, how far we can go when we decide to walk in disobedience. That's why Samuel said, look, this disobedience, this rebellion is like the sin of divination. It means that you're going off and you're searching for another answer rather than the answer being in God. When we seek any other source other than God, even in our own creativity, in our own uh, thinking, in all our own wisdom, we are actually walking away from God. We need to think about some of these things and, and, and a disobedience can cut off the communication lines from God. You say, well, God always wants us. God wants us to, to hear from him. No, listen to what, what is happening here. When Eli and his sons disobeyed God, they forfeited their, sp their special priestly position and the, their dynasty, if you will, because of disobedience is lost. Same thing with Saul. He's disobedient and he walks in disobedience. And in chapters 13 and 15, we see that Saul is forfeiting the dynasty. And slowly but surely, he cuts off all communication with God. Listen to what Amos chapter 8, verse 12, verse 11 and 12 says. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Now, why? If they're really looking, why? Because our evilness, our sin, our disobedience makes communication with God. A, uh, there's a blockade there, if you will. And this is what's happening. Now, after all of this sin, they decide that they are going to walk away from God. But then they want to go back and get a little bit of information. Like here in the chapter 28, Saul wants to go back and say, give me some information, God. What's happening? And, and God says, no, I'm not going to give an answer. In Psalm 66, uh, uh, verse 18, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. 
So we need to be very careful that we are quick to repent of our sins and go into the presence of the Lord. In Proverbs 28 and verse 9, if anyone turns a deaf ear to my instruction, even their prayers are detestable. That's what God says. In 2 Chronicles, you know, we've heard this verse before, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. When I shut up heavens, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. Now, what's the answer? If now the people are crying out and they don't want, and God says, I'm not hearing you, I'm going to allow all of these punishments to come your way. What happens? Because as sinners, we can close up heaven so that God doesn't hear us, God doesn't respond. This is what has happened to Saul. But God gives this indication. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Notice, it doesn't say, and humble themselves and go to mediums. No. My people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways if they'll repent. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear their land. When our sins are forgiven, God hears us and can respond to us. When God then announces judgment unconditionally, the fulfillment of the decree is certain. We learn that from here. Because Saul's life, all of this time from chapter 15, then he knew that he wasn't going to have a kingdom, that God's judgment was going to happen. You can see this happen in verse 4, four when God says to Eli, you are going to lose everything. Your family is not going to, and it happens. When we see the same thing happen in chapter 15, because of your sin, because of your rebellion, because of your disobedience, you're not going to continue with me. And that happens. You know what? The same thing happens over and over again. We are the ones that condemn ourselves. Remember what Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Our wage, our the thing that we deserve because of our sin is death. But it says the good news of Jesus. That's where we are. The good news isn't found with a medium. The good news isn't found in astrology. The good news isn't found in some other source. But it's in Jesus. He says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's what Jesus says in John chapter 14 and verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Saul could never get to heaven through going to a medium. We can never substitute God's duly appointed ways and end up getting to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus. And so what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, one of the things that I see very interesting is that Saul disguises himself when he goes to the medium. Now, Christian, listen to me. Don't disguise yourself. Be a Christian everywhere. It's not a good thing when you feel like you have to be hidden and disguise yourself. When all of a sudden you close the doors, you pull the shutters down, and, and you don't want anybody to know that you are a believer. Daniel did just the opposite. Daniel goes and he opens up his windows toward Jerusalem because of the promise that when it was being dedicated there by Solomon, Solomon prays and says, God, if we are ever evil, we're sinful, and we are deported because of our own sin, and we're in a foreign land, if we turn and we look toward this place that I'm dedicating right now to you, then heal them, hear from heaven, wherever they may be on the face of the earth. And Daniel's taking God at his word, and he's opening up the, the blinds, opening up the shutters, and he's looking toward Jerusalem, and he's praying, and all of his enemies can see him. Don't hide who you are. You hide who you are, I can promise you. The only thing that's going to happen is you're going to be in the sin. That's the only thing. If you want to walk in the presence of God, be boisterous about it. Make sure that everyone knows that you are a person of integrity, that you do what God is telling you to do, that you walk in obedience to him. Run away from all these things. Don't just say, I know what's right and wrong. Saul knew that the mediums were wrong, but he went nonetheless. When you know something is wrong, don't get involved in it. Make sure that you don't go back to the wages of sin because you want to go back and get involved in sin again. Make sure that you stay in Jesus.
and he's the one that can change our past. And as I've said before, any time Saul could have repented. Didn't mean that he was going to have this dynasty, but he could have repented and changed his direction. But we don't have that. He ends up selling his life for sin. Don't allow that to happen. Don't consult the wrong sources. Allow your life to shine for Jesus. Don't have heaven close up because of your sin. You're vacillating back and forth because of these habits of sin or because of, of uh, just not repenting or not spending time in his presence. Make priority. Make it a priority to be right with God and walk as his people, holy and dearly loved by him. Now, let's close with a word of prayer. I want to encourage you, make sure you take time to download that study guide. There's some questions that you can answer. Maybe we'll provoke a little bit of conversation with your family or, or in your own mind, uh, challenge you to walk closer to the Lord because that's, after all, the goal of our study, that Jesus is the answer. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we are so grateful for you allowing us to have these stories and these, these accurate records inspired by the Holy Spirit. There are clearly things throughout Scripture that we may not understand. How it's possible that a medium would be involved in, in giving a word that was, was uh, clear and correct. And, and how Samuel could be pulled up from the grave. And We may not understand all of these things, but we know it's wrong. And Lord, we don't want to be involved in the things that are wrong. We don't want to enjoy sin because in the end, it leads to death. What we want is life in you. Saul quickly moved from one moment to the next, and the next day, he was dead. Lord, we don't want to be people who are dead in our sins now and dead to you for eternity. We want to be alive in you. Give us hope in Jesus. We repent of our sins and we want Jesus and only Jesus. You are our only hope, Jesus. And we thank you for dying on the cross for us. Bless us with an abundance of who you are. And we will never be ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says. And we want to say the same thing. Let us walk around never in disguise, but always being a believer. In your name we pray. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Look forward to being with you again next week. Be blessed.